are uh, continuing our studies of the historical context of the Bible, and we've been looking in the last couple of weeks at Babylon, maybe the most famous of the great Gentile powers that influence the history of God's people. And we are reaching this morning about halfway through the career of Nebuchadnezzar, who is the most famous of the kings of the Babylonians, and we'll finish him up. We'll finish the Babylonians up, and we'll actually get to the moment where there's a kind of a segue from Babylon to the next major empire that will occupy our attention, which is Persia. Persia. Thank you. A plus. There we go. The uh, text that I'd like to have you take a look at this morning, there's actually a couple, and the first one is a very short text. It's the very last paragraph of 2 Kings. It's a chapter 25, and it's a little paragraph that it's easy to read past. If you're kind of skating through the Old Testament and you reach 2 Kings, you're sort of excited to get on to 1 Chronicles. I know that's an exciting place to do your reading, and so... Uh, it's easy to just shoot right past this little paragraph, but I want to read it to you. I, you've, you may have noticed it from time to time in your Old Testament readings, but it starts at verse 27 of 2 Kings chapter 25. It concerns the king that we mentioned in brief last week, whose name is Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin, you may recall, voluntarily surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar. His father, Jehoiakim, apparently committed suicide in the face of the prospect of some kind of attack by Nebuchadnezzar. The younger, the son, Jehoiachin, assessed the situation, decided the smart money, said, just give up. And so he went out with, his, with the uh, queen mother, with the court, with all of the nobility, and they prostrated themselves before Nebuchadnezzar, and he treated them fairly cordially. He did go into exile in Babylon, but he was not tortured or punished or otherwise treated badly, as might have been the case if he had put up a resistance. He's kept in exile for quite a few years, and then just toward the end of his career, still in Babylon, still in exile, we have this little snippet, which is mentioned then at verse 27 of 2 Kings chapter 25 the Word of God. In the 37th year of the exile of King Jehoiachin of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, King Evil Merodach of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released King Jehoiachin from Judah, from prison. I should have said of Judah, from prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the other seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put aside his prison clothes. Every day of his life he dined regularly in the king's presence. For his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king, a portion every day as long as he lived. So, interesting little cameo appearance there by... Jehoiachin. And then the other text I'd like to look at is a very familiar text. If you went to Sunday school as a kid, then this is another flannel graph moment, and it's in Daniel chapter 5. And it's that incident that we commonly refer to as the handwriting on the wall, which of course has become a colloquialism, hasn't it? Whenever something bad is about to happen, and somebody says, I saw the handwriting on the wall. Well, this is, of course, the biblical basis for that expression that we've all heard. And the setting here is now the last ruler of Babylon, whose name is Belshazzar. He's actually the son of the true king, Nabonidus, but Nabonidus is out of town, and he left the shop in the care of his son, Belshazzar, who is therefore called the king of Babylon at this time. And Belshazzar is under siege. Cyrus the Persian has surrounded Babylon, but Belshazzar is feeling pretty cozy because he figures Babylon has the provisions to withstand a 10-year siege. They had all kinds of food storage. They had all sorts of provisions. And so Belshazzar, to try to communicate some sense of confidence to his nobility and to the people of Babylon, holds a great party, as if to say, I'm still in control, I'm still the man, nothing to worry about. 
And to drive home the point, he has brought in all of the sacred artifacts that have been gathered from various temples around the ancient Near East, especially Jerusalem. And so in come the goblets and the spoons and the platters and all of the good things that came from the temple in Jerusalem, holy objects, which had apparently been treated with some respect by Nebuchadnezzar. But now Belshazzar, the grandson, actually more like a great-grandson, is there and he takes these holy artifacts and uses them to have this party. And it's in that context that inscribed on the plaster of the wall, a hand writes, Mene, Mene, Teco, Perez, which would be enough to alarm anybody, you know. And so this is uh, the story of what happens. Then verse 13, Daniel chapter 5. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king said to Daniel, So, you're Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah. I've heard of you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that enlightenment, understanding, and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and tell me its interpretation, but they were not able to give the interpretation of the matter. But I've heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you're able to read the writing and tell me its interpretation, you shall be clothed in purple, have a chain of gold around your neck, and rank third in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered in the presence of the king, let your gifts be for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and let him know the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar kingship, greatness, glory, and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, languages trembled and feared before him. He killed those he wanted to kill and kept alive those he wanted to keep alive. He honored those he wanted to honor and degraded those he wanted to degrade. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he acted proudly, he was deposed from his kingly throne and his glory was stripped from him. He was driven from human society and his mind was made like that of an animal. His dwelling was with the wild asses. He was fed grass like oxen. His body was bathed with the dew of heaven until he learned that the Most High God has sovereignty over the kingdom of mortals and sets over it whomever he will. And you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all of this. You've exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, the vessels of his temple you've brought in before you. And you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. You've praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose power is your very breath, and to whom belong all your ways you have not honored. So, from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Megne, Tekel, Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you've been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed in purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck. A proclamation was made concerning him that he should rank third in the kingdom. But that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. So it's the setting of that story that we want to have before us. And it'll more or less be the end of our discussion of Babylon today. But let's just have a word of prayer and we'll get underway. Father in heaven, we are grateful to you that you have once again given us this wonderful opportunity to be together in this place with your people. And we pray that our reflection on your ways in history and your dealings with your people through history would be 
richly blessed through the presence of your Spirit. And we ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, last week we were in the sanctuary, you'll recall, and at the time I wasn't sure how far we were going to make it, so I am just going to pick up right where we left off. So your brain is just kind of combined last week and this week, and we're just continuing like no interruption, right? So it's all there. We left off with Jehoiakim, who had rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, and when Nebuchadnezzar came with his overwhelming force, Jehoiakim apparently committed suicide, not wanting to fall into the hands of a man not noted for his merciful treatment of rebels. The son, as we mentioned a moment ago, Jehoiachin, takes the throne. It only takes him a few days to figure out he doesn't want to engage in any sort of further rebellion. He prostrates himself before Nebuchadnezzar, and as we indicated, he's hauled off into exile and spends the rest of his life there in Babylon. That brings then his uncle, who is not a true lineal successor to the throne, but who is put there by Nebuchadnezzar to rule in Jerusalem as a puppet king. His name is Zedekiah. And so Zedekiah rules from 598 on as a puppet to Nebuchadnezzar. In about 595, a new king arrives in Egypt who is appealing to Zedekiah to revolt. The, the Egyptians always wanted everybody else to revolt. And they were always the last in line. You notice that? They're the furthest away, so they've got the least to lose and a lot to gain. So they always are trying to inspire everybody else to revolt. And this king is no exception. And so he's appealing to Zedekiah and to others in that region, hey, why don't you guys go out, be brave, step up like men, and revolt against this lousy Nebuchadnezzar, you know. And that does loosen the mortar a little bit of Zedekiah, but not quite persuade him to actually engage in a revolt. But he is thinking about it. It's during this time frame that Jeremiah the prophet is, as we said last week, strenuously warning Zedekiah against revolution. Babylon is God's instrument of discipline. The smartest thing you can do is don't fight it. This is God's medicine. This is God curing his people of their idolatrous, polytheistic ways. And Jeremiah keeps saying, this must happen. And in some ways, Jeremiah implies it's going to be for our good, but you need to submit to it and not keep fighting against it. And so that's the message. At the same time, Jeremiah is sending word to the people in exile in Babylon, settle down. Don't believe this misguided lie that you're going to be coming home soon in the next year or two. You're going to be there for a while. Settle down, plant gardens, get married, have kids, you know, enjoy life in Babylon as best you can. You're going to be there for at least 70 years. And so that message, that letter to the exiles has become one of the most famous chapters, of course, in the book of Jeremiah. We looked at that last week. At the same time, Jeremiah is warning the people remaining home in Jerusalem to submit to the discipline of God coming through the instrument of Nebuchadnezzar. In 593, Ezekiel is commissioned. We talked about that briefly last week. This battle throne, the throne with wheels within wheels, all of which is to say that God is ruling as much in Babylon as he is in Jerusalem. He's a cosmic ruler, not simply a local ruler, which apparently many people hadn't quite understood. And Zedekiah, or, uh, uh, Ezekiel kind of hammers that point home. All right. Well, in 589, a new king shows up in Egypt. So the Egypt continuing to inspire the revolutionary spirit. This guy's name is Apres. He's referred to in the Bible as Hophra. They are actually the same word in two different languages. And so he takes the rule in 589 and once again appeals to Zedekiah to revolt. And this time it works and Zedekiah caves along with other rulers in that region, and it doesn't take Nebuchadnezzar long to show up. So in the fall of the very same year, Nebuchadnezzar arrives with force in that region. He attacks originally Jerusalem. True to form, 
Apries makes good on his promise. He said, if you're attacked, I'll come out and fight for you. So Apries, the Egyptian pharaoh, brings an army out from Egypt and tries to defend Jerusalem. But as it turns out, Nebuchadnezzar is much too powerful and drives him back. And so in 589, the Egyptians are essentially defeated. And now Nebuchadnezzar comes back and in 588, he once again puts Jerusalem under siege. The siege lasts for two years, and in 586, the, the, the uh, walls of Jerusalem are breached, and Jerusalem falls. I've mentioned to you along the way kind of sh the short list of big dates in your studies of the Old Testament. Probably the, one of the most important dates would be 586. There's virtually unanimous consensus among scholars, liberal, conservative, you name it, everybody agrees that in 586, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians, and this was the series of events that led to that. The temple itself was destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar sacked the city. He hauled off to Babylon the artifacts that we were mentioning earlier that were taken from the temple. Zedekiah, for his part, escaped as the battle was going on, running as hard and fast as he could for Egypt, where he thought he might get some protection. However, he was captured halfway to Egypt by the forces of Nebuchadnezzar, brought back to Nebuchadnezzar, who pronounced judgment against Zedekiah. Does anybody know what, what, what Nebuchadnezzar sentenced Zedekiah to for his rebellion? Anybody happen to know a little trivia? Killed his sons, number one, and blinded him, number two. So the last thing Zedekiah saw was his sons being executed before his face, and then his eyes were put out. So the last thing he ever saw for the rest of his life, the last vision, the last image that he ever could reflect on was the sight of his own sons being executed. He was hauled off to live out the rest of his days in Babylon, a blind and, of course, completely humiliated king. And... Uh, uh, Jerusalem itself was put under a governor, so there's no more king now in Jerusalem, but rather a governor named Gedaliah who uh, rules for another year or two, and then he's actually assassinated as well. Jeremiah was given the option. He had been in prison for those last two years. The Babylonians knew who he was. He was a famous guy, and they gave him the option. Jeremiah, who was viewed more or less as a hero from the Babylonian point of view, was told, you can come with us back to Babylon. We'll take nice care of you. You'll have a nice flat screen TV, you know, Blu-ray, the whole deal. You can come with us to Babylon, or if you wish, you can stay here in Jerusalem. It's your call. Jeremiah elects to stay in Jerusalem. The only people staying in Jerusalem were the very poorest of the land who were being left as kind of uh, tenant farmers, you might say, to, to till the land on behalf of Nebuchadnezzar and to work out a living under those circumstances. And Jeremiah prefers to stay there in Jerusalem. As, of course, over the next year or two, he surveys the destruction, the waste, the tragedy of Jerusalem. It moves him to write one of the most pathetic, I mean, I mean that in the sense of filled with pathos, uh, books of the Old Testament, uh, the book of Lamentations, and that's written probably about 585, 584, in which Jeremiah looks at all of the great destruction that's taken place, and yet the very center point, almost if it's a chiatic kind of um, uh, writing, the very center point, the pivot point, right in the middle of Lamentations, is the text from which we got that great hymn. What? What's the hymn that you all know that comes from the very center point of Lamentations? Great is thy faithfulness. And so even under those circumstances, Jeremiah can rejoice, albeit filled with grief, that God has been faithful. And even the discipline that has taken place is a mark of God being faithful to his people. He hasn't destroyed them. He's preserved them. But every son who is loved by a father is disciplined by the father, and in a sense that's what the book of Lamentations is stressing. Nebuchadnezzar, having defeated Jerusalem, turns his attention to the other major rebellious city, which is Tyre, which is on the Phoenician coast, north of Jerusalem. T 
Tyre could always do well in a siege because it was an island city. It was about a half a mile off the coast. And so even though they were cut off from supplies by land, they could always provision themselves by sea. And this is the longest known siege in ancient history. It's documented in external sources, not in the Bible so much. But it took place immediately after the fall of Jerusalem. And it was a 13-year siege of Tyre. Ezekiel mentions something of this. And amazingly enough, the, the, the Tyrians were able to survive even 13 years because they could keep getting their stuff, you see, from, sea, from the sea. But finally, in 572, they say, okay, okay, uncle. And it's not really a defeat, it's simply a voluntary truce in which the people of Tyre agree, the king of Tyre agrees, to pay a tribute to Nebuchadnezzar to get this annoyance out of their lives, this siege that was going on on shore. So that's happening for 13 years. Nebuchadnezzar is not there that whole time. He goes home, and sometime in the next year or two, as best we can reckon, Nebuchadnezzar has the second of the two dreams that are mentioned in his connection in the book of Daniel. This is not documented in Babylonian sources now. This is purely biblical record. Nebuchadnezzar dreams of a great tree. Remember, his first dream was a great image. And that image sort of stood like a timeline for the successive eras of Gentile rule that would take place down to the time of Messiah. This dream is now a great tree, and it seems to be a wonderfully beautiful image. There's shade, there's protection, there's animals that, you know, can reside under the protection of this tree. Birds make their nests in the branches and so on. And so it's a very lovely sight. And all of a sudden, that tree is chopped down. And only a stump is left. And the stump is out there in the middle of the meadow. And it is specifically mentioned with dew on it, you know, day by day. And Nebuchadnezzar is so perplexed by this vivid dream, he can't imagine what it means. He knows it must mean something. It has such powerful detail to it that he immediately summons his wise men, the Chaldeans and all of those people, and they are unable to give any good interpretation. And then eventually Daniel is brought in. And of course, Daniel gives it, I know you know this story, indicating, Nebuchadnezzar, I wish I was describing your enemies. This is you, man. You have been arrogant. You have thought that you were the one by your own great capacities and competencies to have accomplished these things that are your great uh, achievements. But don't you know it's the God of heaven who's done this? You need to humble yourself. You need to recognize him. You need to change your ways. And so Daniel courageously gives Nebuchadnezzar a pretty potent sermon. Nebuchadnezzar says, good, Daniel, that's good. I'll, I'll think about that. Good stuff. Dismisses Daniel. About a year later, we're told, Nebuchadnezzar is out wandering through, you know, the beautiful scenes in Babylon, probably checking out the hanging gardens that he made for Amitus, his Median queen. He's looking and he's saying to himself, man, you are, you are some kind of amazing guy. Look at what you've done. This is amazing. And it's all Nebuchadnezzar. I'm the man. You know, just as he's just about to kind of pop with his own arrogant conceit, the voice comes to him from heaven, as we hear in Daniel 4 saying, and there's a, it's dripping with sarcasm, O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, this is it. And so Nebuchadnezzar is deprived of his rule, and he's reduced to the state of a beast. And I just happened to be there at the time with my digital camera, so I caught a shot of him, and I thought I'd <laughs> pass it on to you. Kind of a sorry sight. And so Nebuchadnezzar is, I'm putting it politely, out of commission for seven years. We would love to find some record of this in Babylonian annals. There is nothing. It's just silent on the point. However, we're not surprised at that. Remember that before the Greeks, history is propaganda. History is not detached reports of what actually happened. It is highly biased reports of what actually happened in which conspicuously absent are any negative pieces of information and greatly exaggerated are any positive pieces of information. The Babylonians did it. 
The Assyrians did it. The Egyptians did it. They all did it. Nobody had a clue about simple narrative history until Herodotus. That's why he's called the father of history. He's the first guy to give us a real glimpse in a sort of detached way of what you know, ancient historical events actually look like. And we've mentioned him and we'll say more about him in time to come. So what we do notice, interestingly, in the Babylonian records is while there's no particular detail about Nebuchadnezzar going into a sort of psychotic fit here for seven years, we notice there's nothing at all about Nebuchadnezzar. Other records continue. They were very good at keeping records of accounting stuff, of you know, all sorts of kind of business as usual, but Nebuchadnezzar just ceases to be a, 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 a subject of conversation for about eight or nine years. It's an argument from silence. I'm not going to stand here and say that proves you know, the, the story, but it's very compatible with the idea that something went haywire and there was just not much to say that was very complimentary for some time about Nebuchadnezzar. And so I can only leave it at that. The biblical record, of course, is much more definitive and indicates that this was God actually making a point and driving home to Nebuchadnezzar that in spite of all that he had achieved what he, by what he thought was his own great abilities, it was all God's doing. Reminds us of Pharaoh, for this, this very reason I have set you up that I might display my power in the world. God is the God of the rulers of this world, you see. And they rule, their rules begin, their rule ends by his decree. That's the biblical message, and certainly the book of Daniel wants to drive that point home with some degree of vigor. Well, Nebuchadnezzar comes out of this time uh, about uh, 575 or so. Again, we can't say with any real clarity or exactitude what it was, but sometime about 10 years before the end of his reign, he does begin to show up again in the records as doing some things. It does seem to be a different Nebuchadnezzar. Now, maybe it's just that he was older. You know, older kings don't go out to battle so much. They're not so excited about risking their necks on the battlefield. It's young kings, especially male kings who like to do that. But be that as it may, uh, Nebuchadnezzar does seem to be quieter. The end of Daniel chapter 4 records for us a remarkable prayer, which seems to reflect in Nebuchadnezzar a recognition of the true God of heaven and earth. I don't know if we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. I think maybe we will. I think there might have been a true, genuine conversion that took place and true faith that occurred. Don't know, you can't tell for sure, but certainly there's at least indicia pointing to that effect. And so with that, we have to leave behind the career of Nebuchadnezzar. He dies in 562, fairly quiet during the last several years, not a lot lot to report. Of course, the people of God are still there in Babylon. And that brings us to the next king. So we've had Nabopolazar, the big one, Nebuchadnezzar. The next one, Evil Merodach. How do you like that for a name? Evil Merodach. And it is simply an accident of language that the word evil happens to be the English word evil. There's no connection. It wasn't, he, that was not a nickname, you know, for the guy. Uh, his actual Babylonian name was something more like Amal Merodach, but somehow it's translated evil Merodach. He only reigned for two years. He was not remembered by the Babylonians as a particularly exceptional king. Wasn't highly regarded, but the, the Old Testament does give him some degree of praise because this is the one, as we noted earlier, who does reinstate Jehoiachin. This had to be extraordinarily encouraging to the people of God in exile. It would be easy to believe that you'd been forgotten. You know, if you're a Christian person, there have been times, I can guarantee it, in your life of faith when you think you suspect God has forgotten you. Remember me? You ever had that feeling? And I think sometimes these exiled Jewish people living in Babylon might have wondered if God had just forgotten about them, just kind of lost track of them, got a lot of stuff on his mind. And then out of the blue, quite unexpectedly, this king, who was otherwise not regarded as any particularly distinguished ruler, goes down and finds Jehoiachin there in exile an old man, and restores his dignity, restores his prestige, 
dresses him in royal robes, has him sit at the table with him, become one of his trusted counselors. What, a, what an astonishing thing that was, and how much it must have said to the people of God, who were very much aware of this, that God had not forgotten them, and that he was keeping alive that chain that would lead from David on one end down to Messiah on the other. And even Jehoiachin, you see, was a link in that chain. And we can look at it and think something very much the same was going on as God was preserving this line from David down to Messiah. Unfortunately, evil Merodach didn't make it very long. He only ruled for two years. And um, Jehoiachin himself was a very old man. There's every reason to think he probably died pretty much at the same time. Evil Merodach was assassinated by his successor, a guy by the name of Neregaliser. Neregaliser is, in fact, mentioned in the Old Testament before he became king. He was one of the military commanders who was involved in the siege of and destruction of Jerusalem. He's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 39. He married a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar and thus married into the family. He didn't like evil Merodach very much, slipped a knife into his back and ascended, you know, asserted himself then as the next ruler. And this is kind of the thing that sort of began happening in Babylon now over the next several years. He only reigned for four years. He died under somewhat mysterious circumstances. And his son, who was only 13 years old, takes over, his name is Labashi Marduk. He reigns for nine months. It's hard to believe, but he, had, he, had, he was so famous for his wickedness at 13 years old that he was grabbed and tortured to death. Killed in a palace coup by Nabonidus, who was the last ruler of Babylon. And so Nabonidus comes to the throne, and we don't really know what claim he had at all to the throne. He himself and his records about himself says he is the son of nobody. That's the term he uses to describe himself. He was a very religious man. He was deeply devoted to the gods of the Babylonian world, especially, and this picture depicts this, the god uh, the, of the moon god, Nana, or Sin, uh, the sun god, Shamash, and uh, the god Venus. And he was especially attached to the moon god because his mother was a priestess of the moon god. And it does seem that that was what drove him. It, it may very well be that's the only reason he was jockeying for this position as ruler of Babylon was to carry out some ambitions he had with respect to his religious designs. His main interest was a temple located in Karan. Now, you'll recall that city, it keeps popping up, and I want to, especially you who've been here for a few weeks, just remind you of a couple of little incidents. I need, I need to remind you of this because it'll make some of what we're going to say in a moment make sense. So, footnote, reminder, footnote now. Assyria fell in 612 to a combined force of the Medians and the Babylonians, Nabonidus, the Babylonian, Syaxares, the Median. They attacked, first of all, Nineveh, uh, basically destroyed Nineveh, but a little skeleton crew escaped from Nineveh and wound up in Karan. This was about four weeks ago we had this conversation. There in Karan, they appealed to Egypt for help, but help was not forthcoming. So, then the Babylonians and the Medes attacked Karan and basically destroy much of it, including the temple. Quran was the venue for the major temple to the moon god, you see. And the very young princess, not princess, I should say, but priestess of that temple was indeed the mother of Nabonidus. So she was sort of pushed out and that temple was destroyed. Nabonidus never got over that. And what he wanted to do was retake Quran and rebuild the temple in honor of his mother, who was no longer with us, but nevertheless he wanted to do this in her memory. That seems to be what drove him. That seems to be the only thing he cared about, was reinstating that temple. And so, what happens now is when he becomes the king in Babylon, 
he wants to get the city of Quran. But you may recall, after the Babylonians and the Medes defeated Assyria, they divided up the ancient world. And the Medians got Quran and parts north, while Babylon got parts south. So Nabonidus didn't have control of Quran, so he appeals to a young prince of the Persians ruling in a province called Anshuan, whose name was Cyrus. And he appeals to this guy, Cyrus, saying, hey, if you'll help me retake Quran, I will help you take over the world of the Medes and the Persians. So we'll have a quid pro quo relationship. You help me, I'll help you. The ruler of the Medes and the Persians at this point was a guy by the name of Astyages. It was the grandfather of Cyrus. Cyrus agrees, and in 551, Cyrus overthrew his grandfather Astyages and became Cyrus, later known as Cyrus the Great, who again is one of the most significant characters to show up in the pages of the Old Testament. There's one Gentile ruler in the Old Testament who's ever given the Hebrew name Messiah. Messiah. There's many people called Messiahs in the Old Testament. Only one of them is a non-Jew. Jeremiah 45, or not Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 45 refers to Cyrus, this particular Cyrus, as a Messiah, an anointed one who God uses for his purposes. And so this is the first great ruler of the Medes and the Persians, and this is kind of how he gets into the story. We'll say more about him, of course, at a later time, but now I just want to kind of work him in so we have that little background going on. All right, so Quran is recovered, and Nabonidus is very happy because he's got the temple, he rebuilds it and so on. From there, Nabonidus, oddly enough, goes south, to a place in Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, called Tema, and he stays there for 10 years. He's the king of Babylon, and he's down in Arabia, apparently on a mystical quest. He's a religious guy. And so he's down there praying a lot, I guess, and he says to his son, whose name is Belshazzar, you mind the shop. And so Belshazzar, the son of Nabonidus, is actually ruling on behalf of his father during the next 10 years. Nabonidus is gone, Belshazzar is ruling. So what's going on is Cyrus is up in the north, he's launching a, an attack e, uh, west uh, into Lydia. We'll look at that a little bit more detail at a later time. Nabonidus left Babylon in the care of his son, Belshazzar, and it's right at the beginning of the rule of Belshazzar that Daniel has a vision that's recorded in Daniel chapter 7. So if you read Daniel chapter 7, you'll notice in the first verse it says, in the first year of King Belshazzar. But understand, King Belshazzar is actually the king regent, as it were. His father is gone, and he's the practical king. And, but the New Old Testament simply assumes his rule at that point. And it's at this time that Daniel has this quite remarkable vision. You may be familiar with it. It plays well into people who are interested in end times prophecies and this kinds of thing. But anyway, there's, there's four great beasts. A lion standing for Babylon, a bear standing for Persia, a leopard standing for Greece, and an iron beast standing for Rome. And then within that context, there is a extraordinary vision of one called the Ancient of Days and one called the Son of Man. And the Son of Man seems to have a kind of divine quality. He's a judge, he's a glorious heavenly being, and he comes to the Ancient of Days to receive a kingdom and to carry out his designs as ruler. Many scholars believe that when Jesus refers to himself repeatedly in the New Testament as the Son of Man, He's making an allusion to that Daniel chapter 7 text and identifying himself as the character who is otherwise described in that Daniel 7 text. I'm not going to say more about that right now, but just kind of tip you off. This is when Daniel has that vision. So that's the first of these. The next vision he has, which is two years later in 547, is in Daniel chapter 8. This is a rather detailed description of Persia and Greece. Greece is pictured as this goat 
that comes raging across the European, or rather more Asian uh, world uh, from Europe and uh, destroys the Persians, and that creates a context for the Maccabean Revolt. I'm going to save any conversation about Daniel chapter 8 until we get to the Maccabean Revolt, which took place about 165, and we'll look at that in some detail then. So I just, again, just mentioning to you, this is the time frame in which that vision takes place. Nabonidus himself realized that Cyrus was becoming increasingly powerful, and he realized at the same time that Cyrus might very well pose a threat to him, that is to Nabonidus. And so he built a great defensive wall. The arrow that I have there is showing a wall he built, hoping to keep the Persians out. It was a wall that extended from the Tigris River to the, to the Euphrates River. It was about 50 miles wide at the point that he built it. And he's hopeful that that's going to insulate and protect Babylon from the Persians. Cyrus had good reason to be unhappy with Nabonidus because he had basically betrayed him, double-crossed him in his battle over in the west, and so Cyrus may have been legitimately concerned about the uh, uh, prospects uh, that really represented the situation in Babylon. Anyway, in 539, after some years of campaigning in, uh, in what we would call Turkey, he turns his attention to Babylon. He makes short work of that wall, he goes down, he lays siege to Babylon. Belshazzar, of course, is inside. He thinks he's in good shape. He doesn't think he's got anything to worry about. And in order to inspire a certain degree of confidence in his lords and ladies there who are part of the court, he has this big party. It's a New Year's celebration. Herodotus tells us detail of the same thing. It's very interesting. Herodotus fully independently gives us a, a somewhat similar account of what happened. He doesn't mention the handwriting on the wall, but he does mention that there was celebration going on and that Cyrus came, and, and Herodotus tells us that the way that Cyrus was able to get in was by diverting the water of the Euphrates. Cyrus was quite an engineer, and about a year earlier he had built a bunch of side canals and eddies and a dam kind of structure so that at his word they could dam up the Euphrates and push a bunch of water off to the side temporarily and cause the water level to, to uh, go down. The Euphrates runs right through the city of Babylon. A river runs through it, you know. But you couldn't get through there when the water was high. But these Persian soldiers could basically wade in knee-deep, took the city without a shot being fired. Belshazzar was assassinated that very night and the rest is history. And so we have an extraordinary confirmation, really, of the uh, biblical account and what actually happened. The handwriting on the wall is interesting. There's three Aramaic words, mene, tekel, peres, and actually a fourth word, upharsin, is mentioned. Those were words that were known to Belshazzar. They were, that was a known language, and they were actually denominations of money. So it'd be kind of like if we were in a room having a party, you know, and not behaving ourselves very well, and all of a sudden we looked up on the wall and we saw something writing dollar, dollar, quarter, nickel. <laughs> that would get your attention, wouldn't it? But you wouldn't necessarily know, what does it mean? And that's exactly where Belshazzar was. He could read the words easily enough, but the meaning of it was completely beyond him. And so Daniel, as you know, comes in, Daniel, by some kind of divine inspiration, immediately knows the meaning. And what it is, is a series of puns. And I wish I could re reconstruct something that really drives the point home in English, but it'd be sort of like this. If Daniel were to say to Belshazzar, using our currency, he would say, you think your kingdom is worth a lot of dollars, but I'm going to tell you, you're going to be drawn and quartered. And I wouldn't give a nickel for what this place will be worth by tomorrow morning. You know, it'd be that kind of thing where you're just taking these words and sort of in a series of puns and little offbeat applications of meaning, applying it. That's exactly what's going on in the, in the original language there. It's very difficult to translate. And so I think English readers just, it's lost on us when we just see those words there because we don't know the kind of the literary connection. But that's the idea. Belshazzar gives Daniel his reward. Notice he makes him third in the kingdom. Why? 
because Belshazzar is, of course, only second in the kingdom. It's one of those amazing details in the Bible that reflects accuracy to what was actually happening. Belshazzar couldn't make him second in the kingdom. Belshazzar was second in the kingdom. So the best he could do was make him third, and that's what he did. But of course, Belshazzar himself uh, had to uh, bring his career to an end within that very night. My Sunday school lesson goes back to Jehoiachin. Three little points just to tuck away. One, Jehoiachin, though he was not remembered as one of the good kings, nevertheless did a right thing. He probably had heard Jeremiah. He realized that he was not in a position, nor was there any wisdom in fighting this man. He surrendered to God's purposes. We need to do that. Sometimes we don't like God's purposes. Sometimes we don't like the way this train is heading down the track, and we protest, but finally there are times in your life and my life when we simply have to say, this is God's purpose, and whether I like it or not, I'm going to submit to it, you know. Give up the fight. You will lose. And there's a great New Testament principle, let a man judge himself, and he will not be judged. And in that case, I think Jehoiachin is a good example of a guy who just judged himself, gave up the fight, and he escaped a consequence so that his was not anything like Zedekiah, who of course had a much worse outcome. Second thing, Jehoiachin is some 30 years in exile, basically in prison, but God provided for him every day. I think maybe Jehoiachin, before he ever learned the Lord's Prayer, was praying, give us this day our daily bread. Because he was a prisoner, and he didn't know if God was going to provide for him. But every day, the food came in. And one of the, it's a very interesting thing. This has been found in Babylonian records. Jehoiachin is actually mentioned by name as the king from Jerusalem, and there's actually an accounting of the food that was provided for him and for his court. It's all tallied in the Babylonian records. God was providing for him, and God will provide for you. So, Sometimes you wonder. Sometimes you think maybe God forgot you. Sometimes you wonder if that next meal is going to come. That next situation is going to work out. Whatever it may be, you fill in the blanks. God is on your side. And he is moving even the Babylonians in, his, in your life to make sure that that food is provided. So don't fear them. Thank God for even those lousy Babylonians. Third thing, third little point. God has a design for you. Isn't it amazing that when Jehoiachin was an old man and probably thought he really was absolutely a has-been, God brought him back and restored him and gave him some deep sense that his life had significance. I think Jehoiachin himself understood that this in some ways was God dramatizing the fact that God was going to make good on his promises and that someday a king would rule over Jerusalem whose kingdom, of whose kingdom there would be no end, as the prophets had unanimously testified. And Jehoiachin himself was in that great line. God has a purpose for you. And even if you're feeling a bit exiled, even if you're feeling like, you know, years are getting on, and, you know, nobody in this room, of course, is in that position, but if you're feeling that way, God still had a wonderful last chapter for Jehoiachin. He has a wonderful chapter for you as well. So believe that and trust God for it.